Um, I don't know about you guys, but I like a good deal. And our next speaker is the founder of DealDay.com. And it's basically, oh, okay. I guess he's famous. <laughs> All right. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Deal Day is a platform where you can go and get um, products and, you know, amazing brands at incredibly priced prices. Yes, thank you. Good. So um, here to talk to us about that is Sim Shagaya. Yes, I've said that right. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here to talk about beyond e-commerce. And I'm going to be talking about that in the context of uh, two different things. Firstly, talking about beyond e-commerce uh, in terms of building e-commerce businesses here relative to what's happened in the West, but also talking about why we are doing this. So firstly, I should start off by saying we've been at this, myself and my colleagues, building businesses like Deal Day and a sister company that's a bit younger called Conga for about two years now. So we're still learning, but I guess the folks at TED feel like we've learned more than most, and we're going to try to share with you uh, a bit of what we've learned. Uh, I need the slides up. Thank you. Okay, so if we're going to understand what's happening with e-commerce, we have to take a bit of a step back and uh, see if there are any parallels in history that in any way tell us how it's going to unfold here in Nigeria. Kola Masha spoke earlier on about agriculture uh, towards the end of uh, the 19th century in America. And at the time, like he mentioned, Americans in the rural areas especially were poor. Simply, America, um, at the end of the 19th century, looked a lot like Africa. So let's go back to the end of the 19th century in the United States and see what happened there. It was 1887 or thereabouts when a train station manager called Richard Sears received a consignment of gold watches from a jeweler that was supposed to be supplied to a local retailer. So he gets these watches. And he goes to the local retailer and says, look, you have these, um, these watches for delivery. But there was a scam at the time in the United States where these wholesalers, these distributors, would send consignments to retailers for sale that were not ordered. And then when they get to the retailer and the retailer says, I didn't order this, they say, well, why don't you just keep it? I'll give you a discount and you can sell it. And that was their way of kind of pushing inventory out. But this particular retailer in this town where Richard Sears worked at the train station, said he would not accept the merchandise. He flat out refused it. So Richard Sears said, OK, you know what? I'll hang on to the watches, and I'll sell them. And so he started selling them to other sort of train station, uh, uh, tra railway staff, and, and uh, train managers that were sort of coming through, through the train station. And in next to no time, the watches were gone. And he had pretty much made more income in that short period of time than his uh, train station ma manager salary could have paid him for what was probably years. And so a company called Sears was born. He quickly moved to, uh, to um, Minneapolis and set up an operation that was sending out catalogs over the railway lines to rural America. His first catalog was composed of watches, which was the business he started with. And he would send you, send you a catalog, and you pick it up at the train station, and you could order watches. Now look at this from the point of view of the rural American, who didn't have access to the goods and all the great things that you'd find in New York or Washington, DC. And so these people started to order things. And in a few years, the CS catalog had grown to several hundred pages and was doing several hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue. And that was the beginning, really, some would argue, although there is some, some previous um, experiments with it, of modern retail. A hundred years later, retail had transformed America. America had gone from $5,000 in income per person to $25,000. Their income level at that point was very similar to where we are in Nigeria today. And as their fortunes rose, as America rose through that period, Sears rose, and its fortunes improved. And Sears came to dominate retail for a hundred years. And during that time, Another company called Walmart was born that we're all familiar with. 
And Walmart rose also and ended up like a, the term that sort of overflowed today, disrupting Sears. And today Walmart has 2 million employees, 2 million, and revenues of $446 billion. Let me put it in context. Walmart, Walmart's revenues are bigger than the GDP of Nigeria. And this is what retail created. And sort of the tree of life, this evolutionary tree of life of retail created all kinds of different formats of retail. Department stores, discount stores, small convenience stores, 7-Eleven. My favorite format, of course, is your TV shopping site, which is the bane of many people in the United States, where you sit at home on your TV and you shop and you buy things. And here we are now in Nigeria. And we had experimented with some of these retail formats before. Some of us remember Kingsway, which was born in 1948, and Leventis. And those great retailers that died away through our structural adjustment program. So today, here we are, the year 2012, and there is no brick and mortar retail. A hundred years or more after Sears, and we have not experienced any of what happened in between. And this is happening as the communications revolution is kicking in. What does this device mean? You know that catalog I talked about before that Sears distributed over the railway lines? Now it can be distributed to your phone. It's brilliant because back then, Sears at its peak printed 75 million catalogs and distributed these catalogs to rural America mostly. And if there was a typo in that catalog, if there was an error, they couldn't recall it. If there was a price change, they couldn't do anything about it. If they wanted to run a promotion, they couldn't change anything. But with our new catalogs on these devices, you can change everything. So what does this mean for retail? What does this mean for us in Nigeria? What does this mean for us in Africa, where brick and mortar retail doesn't even exist at all? One of my favorite songs is Times Are Changing. And it's by an artist called Bob Dylan. And he talks about how the slow ones now will later be fast, and the first ones now will later be last. Simply speaking, it means that sometimes by not investing in old ways of doing things, you can jump entire chapters into new things. And there's nowhere we see that more than in this. Most Nigerians don't even trust calling a landline. They see it with dis distrust. We've jumped an entire paradigm, and we're using mobile phones. So what does this mean for retail? A legendary investor called Yuri Milner, who's invested in companies like Facebook, I said that the Walmart of China is going to be an online company. The Walmart of Africa is going to be an online company. The Victoria's Secret of Africa will be an online company. All of these verticals and businesses that you see in the more developed parts of the world may actually be fundamentally online. But what does this mean? Does this mean we'll see the same rapid uptake in online retail that we saw with mobile phones. It's easy to assume that, right? Because the mobile phone is what's actually delivering the catalog. Africa went from basically no phones to over 700 million phone lines in 10 years. It took the British, um, it, it took um, the United Kingdom a century to achieve an order of magnitude less. Is this what's going to happen with retail? I don't think so, because there are some constraints. You see, here's the thing. On your left, on that screen, is your typical Sears catalog. On your right is Amazon.com. It's still a catalog. A catalog is a catalog. The one on the right is much cheaper to distribute. It's almost free to distribute, actually. But here's the difference. Here's the problem. Actually, I'll give you one more example. On the right is TV shopping. And on the left is a different kind of TV shopping, if you like. Online flash sales, which is the kind of thing that Deal Day does. You see the similarities. 603 sold of Serena Williams' perfume. 27 sold of a fruit, um, uh, some kind of juice mixer. So similar sort of catalog format. But what does that mean? Catalog distribution is easy. But catalog distribution is not the same thing we are finding as merchandise distribution. This is a very important fact. We have a very lively tech community in Africa, and we get very excited about e-commerce and its prospects. 
and we talk about building the Amazon of Africa. But we should be talking more, rather, about building the Sears of Africa. Why? Because when Sears launched, the infrastructural context of America was more similar to Africa. When Amazon launched, it had the United States Postal Service that can get you a letter from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in two days. When Amazon launched, it had a prolific network of infrastructure and roads and rail lines and planes that could move things around. When was the last time you walked into the Nigerian postal services, a local post office, and put in a letter? Who's done that recently? <laughs> Precisely. So there's a disjoint here. The catalogs can get out, but the merchandise can't. And what does that mean? You must respect what Amazon has achieved. It became the largest retailer in a very, very quick period of time. But they did that with great logistics. Without discounting the efforts of its founder, Jeff Bezos, and Amazon, on the other hand, there are other companies that maybe should draw our respect even more. Flipkart in India, which has had to build out a, a catalog distribution network, while at the same time building the network for the distribution of merchandise from scratch. 360 Buy in China, that is doing the exact same thing. Having gone through $1.5 billion in investor money, is fighting a price war and may be stuck in perpetual unprofitability. But it's an epic effort. Uzun in Russia, similar thing. Let's look at this a bit closer. I have a graph here. It's as complicated as we're going to get. From left to right of each graph is technology, which is just you know, sort of your online catalog and your recommendation engine and people that bought this like that. Order fulfillment, delivery. And you can see for Amazon, delivery was, was relatively easy. Supply lines. Amazon has all of its supply lines locally. All of the manufacturers are in the United States. At least there's enough throughput coming in from China to supply um, those retailers. Human resources. Trained, educated people who have technology experience and retail experience. Competition. Now you compare that to everybody else and you start to see that the landscape looks a bit different everywhere else. In other countries, e-commerce is not just about catalog distribution. It's also about building out logistic networks that span vast tracts of land. Incredibly difficult task that is much more about technology. Let's look at this even closer. One company that I respect really greatly is Ozone in Russia. It's 14 years old. For the first five years, it struggled. This is not a one-year story. It's not a two-year story. This is an epic 14-year story that's still unfolding. They have built 2,100 pickup points across 17, 000, 17 million square kilometers. To put that in context, Africa is just over 30 million square kilometers from Cape Town to Cairo. So these guys are building out a logistics network in a land mass that is about half the size of Africa. That's effort. And the last point scares me quite a bit. They've burned through a number of CEOs in doing this. And here's our own baby our dear Africa. And this is what building online retail in Africa means in terms of complexity. Technology we must import from our brothers in India. Order fulfillment, difficult. No postal system, you have to build it yourself. Supply lines, no manufacturing. At least it's starting to pick up, but we import virtually everything. HR, because of the ineptitude and the incompetence of historical governments, we don't have maybe 100 qualified PHP programmers in all of Lagos. We have nobody that truly understands the intricacies of retail. Competition, not too bad because margins in Africa are good. But at the same time, our governments leave us to foreign competition, which is great. I don't advocate protectionism for retail. Let us compete on a global level, not a problem. So this is what building online retail in Africa means. So what is our path? It's going to be very different from the West. This is an epic journey that myself and my colleagues are undertaking. Our growth is not going to be straight up. We're not launching in an America where everyone had a credit card at the time Amazon launched, and everybody had a fixed line with DSL connections. We're launching in a context where the economic growth is still rising. We're launching in a context where the internet adoption itself is still rising, just like Sears when income was rising, just like Sears, when the railway lines were still being built at the time they launched. 
We think that the future of online retail, and this is one thing that keeps me up at night, will be different, not just from brick and mortar retail, but it will be different from even e-commerce in other parts of the world. We think it will be a wedding of physical and virtual spaces. You see, Sears, 25 years later, even after the death of its founder, went from catalog to brick and mortar. The catalog distribution did not neutralize the need for physical space. What this marriage will look like, we're not sure. And also, necessarily, it must unleash the energies of small and informal retailers, manufacturers, and farmers. This is a necessary condition. Sears grew because it empowered rural Americans. We cannot simply target urban Africans and wealthy Africans and claim that we have succeeded. So what does this mean? I refer to these businesses as the machines. Because as soon as we started Conga, for example, it seemed to take on a life of its own. It seemed to just stretch on and want to create order. All of a sudden, forms were being created, and my colleagues were off creating things and doing things that I didn't explicitly ask them to do. It seems to have a motivation of its own. But more than anything else, it's more than internet. It's real people with real effort. It's real warehouses that take five months to find. It's real drivers that we have that are working even on Sundays and getting run over by real taxis in some cases. This is what it means. It is vast amounts of capital. It is the fact that you set off on a journey, and this, I think, should encourage all of us, knowing that the resources you have are not sufficient for that journey. It's like setting off on a ship, and the supplies on that ship you know are not sufficient. And you don't even know when the next port is, but you have faith. It is incredibly difficult, but we have to do it. And so you ask, you know, you've, you've painted a pretty grim picture, Sim. Why would anyone, anyone be so masochistic or self, uh, uh, inf inflict so much pain on themselves by doing this? Because we believe that it must be done. Because we believe that sustainable consumption is inextricably linked to the rise of the human spirit and the human condition. Because we believe Africans have a right to consume. And because we believe deeply that with foreign friends and foreign partners and foreign capital, all of that is not, in, is not sufficient if the local intent is not there, meaning we must do it ourselves. Because we believe this infrastructure has to be built. That is why we're setting ourselves on this journey. I'm going to finish off with a quote from um, uh, a line from a poem I love, from a writer I love called Ben Oakley. It's, uh, it's to be found on the walls of the Houses of Parliament in London. I'm not sure if he wrote it, if his intention was this was for the British people or the African people, but I read it as meaning it's for us. Let the energy of commerce flow. Let the energy of commerce flow and technology will provide the tools. When I read this from Ben, there's a part of me that says, Conga is much more than ab about capitalistic intent. There are easier ways to make money in Africa. Deal Day is much more than looking for money. It's about lifting the African spirit. But even more than that, let me just close on one note. I think we're coming full circle. And I think our down cycle started at with a commercial event also that not only scarred Africa, but scarred all of humanity, which is slavery. And by doing things like this, our team and the many others out there trying to do things like this can lead us to some redemption, to some redemption. I genuinely believe this. And this is why we're setting off to do these things. So as you go off, and if you choose to follow this path like we have, remember that it's not the path the West has taken. It's not even the path India has taken. It must be our own way. We must learn lessons from the right context in the United States. Thank you.